Happy Friday, guys, and welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Dubs. I'm your host, Bill T. Another Friday, another fantastic podcast. Whether you're on your way to work or you're headed home or you're just kicking back today because you're down to a four-day work week and you're getting ready to start turning some wrenches on your VW, man. I appreciate you guys tuning in to listen. Now, today's podcast is going to be great. I'm on my never-ending quest to bring you knowledge, information, and history and all sorts of things in the VW world. I'm excited to get this one out to you this week. We were hoping to kind of time it with the release of this magazine. And on the, in this month's issue, June 2023, Hot VW's Magazine, uh, we've got a 1963 1500 variant owned by my buddy Lee Hedges, restored by Pedro Sainz. And uh, one of the nicest early type three variants that's out there. So this is an in-depth podcast uh, today that's going to get deep into the type threes, the details of the early type threes and all the things that you didn't know that you needed to know about early type threes. And it'll kind of open your eyes to the scarcity of the early type three variant. So I'm excited to do this. Uh, you know, I've been wanting to do a type three special for a long time. And this one is going to be uh, type three by, with my type three ninja Lee hedges, man, he's, he's my go-to guy. When I got something type three that I need to know about, uh, I definitely lean on him a lot and he's just a wealth of knowledge. So I'm excited to bring this one out to you this week, but I did want to remind you guys, if you haven't had a chance with this video or with this podcast, there's a video that's accompanying this video. So this podcast is derived from a video that, that we did on a conference where we actually go through and look at images of the specific details that he's talking about that bring you another level of detail. So I want you guys, when you click on the link to my YouTube channel below, I want you to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Why? Because when I get to a thousand subscribers, which seems like nothing for most people, but for me to get a thousand subscribers, I'm going to be able to do live streams, which means when I go to the classic, when I, when I go to bug around, if I go to any of these locations and decide to do a live stream, I can live stream it right from there and bring you guys some live Johnny on the spot content on YouTube. So trying to make this uh, really just super access for you guys to be able to get to and ingest some good VW content. So make sure you not only subscribe to my YouTube channel, but don't forget little bro George, go check out his YouTube channel, The Wagon. There'll be a link at the bottom where you can subscribe to his YouTube channel as well. If you guys wanna do anything that you can do for me, like Bill, you bring us so much great content. What can we do for you? Here's what you can do for me. Share the podcast. Share this podcast with as many friends in the VW hobby as possible. Uh, sometimes you just gotta force them to listen. Like, bro, listen. Like, I don't listen to. You know, we got all these dopey friends with these dumb rules. Uh, I'll call out my buddy Cliff in particular. I don't listen to podcasts. I only listen to reggae music all the time. I'm like, bro, you're missing lots of good content. And so, most people I know that don't normally listen to podcasts, once they start listening to this podcast, they'll start at the beginning and just start knocking them out one after the other because the content is so good. The hobby is about the people and the stories behind the people, and that's what's really you know got me excited about doing what I do. So make sure you guys share the podcast and slap some of your friends around. Look, you're going to have to get physical guys. You're going to have to talk with your hands. You have to sit them down and say, look, bro, Bill T says you need to listen. You better get your life right and start listening to Let's Talk Dubs because we're bringing you the cutting edge stuff. The magazine just came out. We got an in-depth podcast about early type threes, bringing this magazine 3D for you. 4D because now it's going on YouTube as well. So there'll be a link at the bottom of this podcast where you can click and watch the video that corresponds with this podcast. And we do both of that. So it's always good to listen to it. And then you want to see the visuals of it. You go to our YouTube channel and check that out. So make sure you guys do everything you can to, you know, help us grow this, uh, this organically grown podcast. I'm real reluctant to spend money in marketing and all this stuff. Not that I'm wanting it to be, but I really have this dream that it's going to be successful by, the listeners, you know, people that appreciate the good content because I started this as, as just a, a, a hobby to just something with no plan to make it, um, to make it something that people would want to listen to or just interesting content. And it, it's just taken on this whole thing where, where it's this huge passion for me and I love chasing down the history and connecting the dots and all these things that I didn't know. And as I'm discovering these things, you guys are on that journey with me. We're discovering them together and we start putting the pieces together of how things came to be and through the right podcast, through the right interviews, 
we're getting the real information on how things came together. So lots of cool stuff coming up. It reminds me of some podcasts that I have that are coming out for you guys that I'm super excited for because these are going to be podcasts that, that are just so cool because they go so deep in history and peel back some layers of things that we didn't know. So I'm excited for all that to come up. But I wanted to give a shout out to some people that were supporting on uh, that that did support the podcast. But first, if you guys purchase some merch from me and you haven't got it, send me a DM on Instagram. Send me an email at Bill. Let's talk dubs.com. There's a couple people that uh, my, my guy, uh, Damien Tejera, has been waiting for a while. I was in London when I got his order, never shipped it out. So I shipped it out with some extra stuff in it uh, this last week. And uh, Damien, I appreciate your patience, man. Good looking out. If you guys want to send me a general reminder like, yo, bro, where's my stuff? <laughs> I'll match it up with the receipt. I'll check my shipping stuff. And every now and again, something slips through the cracks. I know I'm still dragging a couple of my What's Your VW Story shirts. And I'm, I was a little frustrated about that because I've got some people that have been waiting on some. And as soon as I get those, as well as uh, the sand shirts, the old school shirts seem to be doing quite good. But, you know, even better, I just ordered about um, about 190 more shirts and shirts and sweatshirts sweatshirts just in time for summer so you're lucky yeah that's right i'm thinking ahead i'm i'm thinking about next winter and i've got a new logo two new logos that are pretty rad i really dig them and uh i want you guys you'll be the first to hear them uh to hear about them especially if you're uh, you know subscribed to my youtube channel to my youtube channel or to my uh instagram or facebook those will be the first people that i'll let see the new the new uh, logos and stuff, which are pretty rad for the shirts to bring you guys some more cool content. Um, and I'm excited to be able to pr- provide that for you guys. Uh, because people just been enjoying, uh, the old school sand shirt has been selling like crazy. So, uh, I do have the, uh, one crazy weekend design shirts up. I, they're, they're just the logo design from last year that was drawn by Steve Nazar. That's on our website now. Uh, I took all the sponsor logos off of it, so it's just the logo, so it's more of a shirt. I don't have any dates or anything on there, but it's more kind of a design shirt, and it's a front design, not a rear design, so it's a little different. You know, um, I'm always switching stuff up and, and doing a little bit of this, a little bit of that. We're not uh, – everything we produce is not the exact same, so um, I'm I'm able to to come up with a couple new, new designs because the guys make my shirts for me, and uh, Carl Bland up there does a good job you know, coming up with some creative ideas with his art group. So it's pretty cool. I, I dig it. Also, if some of you guys are out there, are artists like Mr. Dan, 1976, you can follow him on Instagram. He did our 2023 logos that hasn't been printed yet. It's going to be on the poker chips. It's going to be on all the artwork. It's on the flyers for this year's event. He's got a sick rad graffiti style. I'm totally into like the work he does. I hit him up on Instagram and he said, Hey man, I'd love to do the logos for you this year. I've had a couple other artists that have reached out to me. And if you guys have any ideas and you want to submit them to me, send them to me at Bill Let's Talk Dubs. I would gladly do uh, a joint venture with some artists out there on some merch and we'll figure out something where I definitely, uh, you know, kick down something for the art for, um, you know, if it's something cool that I dig and, and I think it's rad and definitely, you know, help get your name out there, man. That's what it's all about, just people helping each other out. So uh, if you guys have any interest in that or people are wanting to do something like that, let's, uh, you know, I'm game, so don't uh, don't hesitate. If you're an artist, you got some your juices are flowing about VW stuff, and you're like, bro, Bill, I got this cool idea for Let's Talk Dubs. I'll send it to you. If it's cool, if 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 I dig it, you know, and I'm pretty I'm pretty broad range, man. I like a lot of different styles and stuff. So by all means, if uh, if you think it's cool, man, send it to me, and we'll see what we can do. I mean, put it up there and see and, and see what the uh, see what the the crowd thinks about it, but. Uh, definitely want to help out anybody that I can. So um, good looking out for the people that supported the podcast. And uh, I want to give a shout out to David Cronin and he's out of Phoenix, Arizona, picked up a shirt today, picked up a shirt this week. Uh, appreciate him for supporting the podcast. Well, I think I've rambled long enough today, but appreciate you guys. Don't forget to support the podcast. I've been getting a lot of pre-registration on one crazy weekend this year. One crazy weekend is going to be October 6th and 7th at the Orleans Hotel and Casino. Go to letstalkdubs.com to find out more information about one crazy weekend. And you want to register today. I got a lot of people already pre-registering for the show. I'm super jazzed. It's going to be an off-the-chain event. It's going to be happening October 6th and 7th at the Orleans Hotel and Casino. You don't want to miss out on that. So make sure that you guys go 
and get your rooms booked. Book your rooms. I can't say it enough. Book your rooms now. Book your rooms, book your rooms, book your rooms. Um, I'm excited for this event coming up. It's going to be it's going to be super. I mean, I, I can't even express to you how good it's going to be because last year, if it's like the last couple of years, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and more people and more fun. And it's just a huge hangout for the weekend. It's like a kickback, bro. If you guys haven't, <laughs> if you guys have not watched the real bros of Simi Valley, dude, I'm telling you right now, uh, that show is, is the best. Dude. It's on, it's on a Facebook TV show. Call me a nerd, bro. But I, it has me dying, dude. So that's your suggestion for me today. Go check it out. Go find it on Facebook. Watch. It's called Real Bros of See Me Val. I'm going to tell you right now, dude. It is, bro. It's so funny. I can't even take it. So um, lots of good stuff, man. Lots of good stuff coming up. Lots of great podcasts headed for you. But today, we're going to take it 4D. 4D chess here. <laughs> It's going to be the interview with Lee Hedges about his 1963 VW variant and what makes early type threes rare. All the one-off items we go through this thing. It takes an hour to go through. There's so many unique things about the early type three variant, AKA the square back that you knew or never knew. Most of you guys probably like me didn't know because you know, we're just, we're just, we're just dudes in the hobby, but this is one of the ones we get deep in the weeds, plenty of interesting content. You might look around your garage and find you have some hidden gems there. So uh, we're going to get into it, guys. So without any further ado, let's get into it this week with my boy Lee Hedges on his 1963 variant. Early Type 3s, what makes them rare on Let's Talk Dubs. You probably don't know that there's a new Volkswagen out that doesn't look like a Volkswagen. Okay, everybody. So on today's show, I've got an exclusive. You know what hasn't been done in a long time is there are uh, there's a lot of information on the Type Threes, but I don't think it's been served any justice. And of course, like always, you know, I'm here to try to bring you guys the most uh, the most information that I can on these particular models. And on today's podcast. We're going to be doing a Type 3 special, specifically to early Type 3s. And my guest today, is, uh, who's been on the podcast before, is Lee Hedges. As we get this started, today's show is going to be specifically on the early Type 3s. And we're going to be using your Type 3, which is being featured in Hot VWs, as kind of exclusive for us to kind of walk around, get an idea of what we're looking at, um, and just give us some information on the early Type 3s. Now, just to get everybody up to speed, with respect to the Type 3, can you give us a little upfront history on the reason Volkswagen developed the Type 3 to begin with? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's, it's a really cool story because uh, in the late 50s, Volkswagen was really starting their export program, export to the U.S., and the U.S. just began to start gobbling up Volkswagens. And they noticed, as they did in the rest of the countries around the world, that they had the, the Beetle, they had the bus, and they had the Type 14 Carmagia. They were all running on the same motor. So when Americans got involved, because Americans like a little bit more power, a little bit more comfort, a little bit more space, uh, they noticed that uh, they needed to generate a series of cars that were in the 1500 CC class, which the Beetle was at 11 and 1200 CC. So um, they came up with an idea. Heinz Nordhoff was the managing director there at Volkswagen, and he came up with an idea that we needed a three compartment design where the beetle just had the back seat and the front hood to store stuff and the bus same thing they needed to be able to put things in three different compartments which was the norm for more of the middle class cars that had a little bit more power had a little bit more comfort a lot more standard features uh, more space for storage and so the type three line was developed in secret actually beginning in 1957 and 58 where they uh, had a burned out building at Wolfsburg and they just kept the windows closed up and they'd started doing development for the type three or the VW 1500 series in this building. Nobody knew about it. Access to the building was strictly prohibited. And uh, even people at Volkswagen didn't know about it. The big reason was is because they were worried that the public was going to think that 
Volkswagen was going to end of life the Beetle, which was never the case. The Type 3 Series was always going to be an addition to uh, the, the Beetle and the Transporter Series. And, and I think that may be one of the things that, you know, I think a lot is that, you know, at least that was my impression. The Type 3 was built to replace, oh, I don't want to say replace the Beetle, but it was built to be like Volkswagen's real car, per se. You know, have, yeah, it definitely, uh, it definitely had a lot more modern features to it than the Beetle or the bus ever did. A lot more, it, it was really a lot more of a, an optioned vehicle compared to the compared to the beetle right i mean that's and that's the reason that the platform yeah, came they, they came with a full line of the platform what, what did they debut at the auto show so at the uh, frankfurt auto show in september of 61 uh they announced it to the public and had on the there's two different booths there there was a volkswagen booth and there was a carmen booth because carmen of course had built the convertibles and the type 14 gears so in the volkswagen booth they had the sedan, the notchback, they had the estate wagon, which was the variant, and they had a notchback convertible uh, as well, which was a four-seater prototype at the time that they fully intended to build but never did. And then in the Carmen booth, they had the Type 34 Carmen Ghia Coupe and the Type 34 Carmen Ghia Cabriolet. Again, the Cabriolet had really limited production and then was stopped early on. So there were five models in the VW 1500 early series uh, that they launched in 1961. I mean, that was pretty revolutionary for Volkswagen that they had really a hit with the Beetle and then they end up deciding, we're not only we're just gonna come out with the Type 3, we're coming out with five different platforms. I mean, so they really must have had a lot of confidence in the Type 3 and where it was gonna go. What about, how how was it received from a sales standpoint when it was you know first put out there well the the type 3 was 25% bigger 25% stronger engine um, more space inside more comfort inside and so right away all the public saw was a much more advanced vehicle it had mechanically a lower center of gravity motor in the back that was a different design and it produced more horsepower. It produced 45 horsepower at that point and the later ones, uh, 50 and 55 horsepower. So, um, it just had all the advanced features that the beetle wasn't going to get for several more years. Now in, in, our, in this podcast that we're doing right now, this one is going to be specifically talking about because when we look at the type three platform as a whole if we're looking at generations there's really the first and second generation but the first generation can actually split into two maybe even three different categories what how would you classify the type threes as far as the 62 to 60 the 62 to 69 models would you say there's two so for, kind of early and late of the early style yeah, I mean, for, for me, um, the 61, 62, and 63 are considered the early style where it has a lot of features that were never featured again and real easy to identify. And then you have the S model series with the N model series in 64 and 5 that had high compression motor um, and was, was the first Volkswagen to reach 100 miles an hour. That was a big deal. Yeah. And then in 66 through 69, they went back to sort of a pedestrian, lower compression, uh, lower, better maintenance um, kind of version. And that's when they launched the, the Fastback as well. So they came out with an additional model line in 66. So um, I think of basically three different eras of cars during that time. And there's, there's easy ways to identify each one of them. So let's start with, well, let's just start with, in particular, the the spotter's guide, right? From outside, from 20 feet away, how do you identify like a really early square back? Or type the, the er easiest thing to look for is called the high side marker lights. And so those are a side light that's on the, the belt line of the car that's just above the body midline. And early type threes never had any body trim. So this line that goes down the center of the car all the way around the whole car, didn't have any body trim. And in later years, in 64, they came out with an aluminum trim. So if you look at a car and you see one without trim, 
and it has the high side marker light, then that's the easiest way to identify an early 63 and earlier type 3. So the first thing, when you see a, a shaved, quote-unquote shaved square back, it could be an early one that you see, right? <laughs> right. Now, and then, and then there's another one that if you look down on the bottom where the reflector is, the reflector isn't chromed. The base of the reflector is painted the body color. So that blends in, and it's a short reflector. Back in 64, when they came out with the 100-mile-an-hour the S models, it was a chrome wraparound one that, that went around the whole back end of the car. Real easy to spot a chrome version, and that was continued all the way through the series. So if you look for the very short version of those rear reflectors, you'll notice that that's the early style. If you look at the flat taillight lenses, these hug and conform with the fender design here. In 64, they changed it to the ones that have a wider lens that comes out more, so the visibility is better. Um, but the, the flat lenses are another feature of an early car. So flat lens. From 20 feet, it may or may not be able to tell, but the back window trim is wider on the early cars as well. So all the trims, the aluminum trims that go around the windows, and on the back windows, they're wider than the 64 models, which are thinner. So you've got So you've got the... So just to clarify, the flat lenses, which in the, in the 90s customization of the Type 3 era, the flat lenses were up to 63 only? Yeah, everybody used those. The 64 <laughs> models, when they came out with the S models, came out with the bigger lenses. And now, with respect to exterior, there's also, um, because it didn't have the side belt line trim, it was also uh, lacking the front hood as well? Yeah, the trim that the aluminum trim that runs along the lower portion of the front hood, where you lift the front hood up. On the later models, they have an aluminum trim there. On the early models, no trim at all, uh, as clean as clean as can be. And um, the earliest of them even have a rounded VW emblem, which is uh, very very rare. But um, the no hood trim is is a big easy way to spot an early car. The rims as well, if you look at the rims of the car, in the early years, they two-toned the rims. Um, the early Type 3s have a, a light-colored outer rim color and a dark-color disc color, so a two-toned rim. It didn't come with trim rings. Because they were two-toned, they were, they were pretty enough as they were, and you just had the chrome hubcap to make things look nice. Well, in the 64 model, they came out with an aluminum trim ring that covered up the entire rim. So you didn't see anything other than the black rim behind it. So Now, what's interesting is a, a few a few months back, I had posted, I was at my friend's yard, v, longtime VW guy, and we found a wheel there that we couldn't identify. And it looked kind of like a bus wheel. It looked like a 14-inch bus wheel, but it was 15 inches. And it was we just couldn't make sense of it. And then I posted on my Instagram and you immediately chimed in and said, that's an early type three wheel because we were looking at it like, wow, it's kind of weird. It's like a bus wheel, but it doesn't have hubcap clips on it. Cause it takes a, it takes a late model style hubcap, or I guess that would just be a type three style hubcap, right? Which later moved on to the beetle as well. well. If you look on the inside of that rim where the clips normally are on a beetle or a bus, you don't have any hubcap clips. You just have these little nubs. There's three little nubs that are built into the rim to hold the hubcap. Yeah, no. So I thought it was neat that, you know, he and I were stumped and immediately you chimed <laughs> and said, nope, that's an early type three wheel. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And that's now, a valuable wheel. You send that to me. Well, yeah, I need one of those. I'll get you that wheel, buddy. Don't you worry about that. That <laughs> Consider it yours. Um, so now the, finishing talking about the front end, what else on the front end is different on an early type three? So the earliest type threes had bullet front turn signals. So just like you see on a 50s bus or on an early Type 14 Ghia, you had these little pointed uh, bullet turn signals. And those were unique to the earliest years as well. Um, because they were never exported to the U.S. in those years, you didn't have sealed beam headlights. So their headlights are going to be the European bulb style headlight with the SB12 chrome ring. Same one that's used on a Beetle. So... Um, the front end looked really simple with the no trim, no extras, um, one set of headlights, and uh, and just the bullets up front. 
And then uh, there's one more other thing on the exterior. Well, two more other things on the exterior of the card that I can remember. And one's uh, near the rocker area. That's right. It. So in the in the rockers here, you have what's called a slash trim, and it's a it's a rocker trim, a wide rocker trim. That at the end of it, at the very end of it, it has a slash design. Instead of being blunt straight up and down, it's got an angled slash design to it um, for the rocker panel areas, and uh, those were used just on the early ones as well. Yeah. And as uh, and as you're talking about this, I've got pictures coming up on the screen of all the stuff we're talking about. So, <laughs> so uh, I've got your back, buddy. Um, and then, and then in- you know, there's one more thing that this kind of neat is is that square backs or variants had a stationary window in the very back, and then they had a pop out window as an option in this middle window here behind the door. And so, in this case, in the earliest ones, this was not a standard feature. You had to order pop-out windows as an extra item. And so this one is early enough where that item wasn't available. So it has stationary windows on both sides here. And you can see the reason why they'd want that pop-out window is to help ventilation for those rear seat passengers. So now, that optional item became a, became a thing and then eventually became a standard item. Now, speaking of... Um production numbers of the early type threes the 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 first segment 61 through 63s what do we have in respect to production and what do we have that we know of in the registry so so unfortunately volkswagen did not share their production numbers for the type three models for that year Mm -hmm. for those early years Um, we know that they made you know three million type threes there's tons made but the earliest years Um, all were pre-America export. So the production was really low and they made many more notchbacks than they did squarebacks, more than variants. Uh, For obvious reasons that the notchback was a sedan, like a Beetle version, so it was less expensive. The variant was 25% more uh, and and, uh, less production. So there were many many more notchbacks out there made in the early years than the early variants. Also, the variants didn't start production until March of 1962, where the notchbacks had started production way back in mid-61. So there were a whole, almost a whole year worth of production of notchbacks before the variants were even started to be built. That's interesting. Now, as far as numbers left, I, I've been trying to collect the serial the the vin numbers for all the early variants out there in the whole world and we've been doing this now for about five years and we only have 75 cars known that is ridiculously low for uh 63 and 62 variants there's only five right hand drive early cars known and 70 left hand drive cars known so it's by comparison, I also keep track of the Type 34 group. Right. And in 1963, there's over 263 Type 34s, and there's only 75 total 62 and 3 variants. So it's, it, it's, it's almost an unknown thing, and I didn't know it either until I started figuring it out that you just don't ever see these out here anymore. Yeah, so I, I mean, so now you're talking 62 and 63 – we don't have the production numbers, but basically what we see out there available for sale is like super rare if you can find them. And then um, what would like, what would be the Holy grail of early type three variants to find? Um, Well, I mean, any, anything with a low mileage, original pain, of course, um, you know, the, the problem with variants were they were commercial use vehicles. They were used by TV repairmen. They were used by florists. They were used by mechanics. They transported goods just like a truck would. And um, so they get they get abused pretty badly, and not a lot of them survive when they get abused that much. Yeah. I think that's part of it. Now, uh, no- there are no sunroofs on early variant cars. We have zero sunroofs, which tells you, that as a commercial type vehicle for transport, you didn't need an extra sunroof. 
Notchbacks had sunroofs. Type 34s even had sunroofs, but not the variant in the early years. And what was, um, so what's the first year sunroof for uh, the Type 3, the Type 3 model altogether? Uh, well, they had them in 62 on Notchbacks. So Notchbacks, what about? And they had them in late 62 for Type 34s. Okay, so 62, they were available, but they, and then in the notchbacks, they were manual, and the type 34s, they were electric? Yeah, notchbacks were a hand crank mm-hmm. where you cranked this handle and then the notchback sunroof slowly opened up. On a type 34, you had an electric button and the electric sunroof motor in the back pulled the sunroof open and closed. That's great. Do you know how much the sunroof option was? I think it was 750 Deutschmarks. And so divide that by four and you get dollars, a couple hundred bucks. Yeah. So, and that was fairly expensive for a Seems car. Seems like it'd be worth it, huh? Right. In today's money. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I would take, if I was going back, I would have taken the notch convertible and the type 34 convertible just because they were only 750 more than that. Now, speak, so, now speaking, yeah. of, and, and that's one question maybe that, that I, that I've been wanting to know for a long time with the notchback convertible and the type three convertible, were they actually ever produced or were they all prototypes? The notchback four seater convertible was built as prototypes and tested extensively tested by Carmen. And then it was decided that they were going to remain prototype production and never be mass produced. And there were several made, there was one that was crashed. And I believe today there are two, both at Volkswagen's museum, one in the display area, which is red, and one that's hidden down in the downstairs basement. So there's two notchback convertibles left. Type 34s, they planned to go to production with the convertible. So in uh, 61 and 62, they started testing of that convertible version. Um, in 19, late 1960. Two in November, October, November time frame, they actually put it into production and Carmen started building convertible type 34s. They got to finishing 15 of them and Volkswagen pulled the plug on the series because, well, for a variety of reasons, but mainly because there were labor shortages in the factories and they weren't able to meet the demands for notchbacks, type 34s, uh, type 14 coupes and convertibles, Beetle convertibles, all of that stuff. So they halted the Type 34 convertible product, and there were only 15 ever made. So there were actually some production Type 34s put out there. That yeah, it, they were never sold to the public. Oh, really? And the ones that were built were given away to the gross handler, the large v- VW dealerships in Germany, as a thank you for being a great dealership. And they were put in dealership showrooms and never sold. Oh, so they were kind of given as like, here's a token of our appreciation, but you cannot sell this car. <laughs> right. That's wild. Well, and so, there's about uh, five to six left today, all in Germany. Yeah, that's crazy. And Christian Grunman's got a few of them, I bet. He has one. He has the, the, the uh, Pacific Blue version. They were all made in white except for one for Mr. Carmen himself. And he made a light blue one. And at that time, that was called specific and uh he's actually right now in the restoration phase of it and it just got painted i saw pictures of it today actually and and what year did they make the convertibles so it was only over a two-month period from from october to december of 1962 perfect so the the convertibles were just really built for a super short period of time and most of them ended up being prototype cars is that right uh, yeah, they were they were proto- they weren't prototype. They were mass production cars. They went through the Carmen assembly process and they got painted and they got all the regular parts fitted to them. They just stopped it after only fifteen cars. That's crazy. And how many do they have a record of existing yeah. today? Uh, today, as far as we know, there's between five and six that people know of. And so that means that there's roughly ten more that either people are going to find or that got crushed or uh, who knows what happened to them, but there's still, 
you're saying there's still a chance to find one. That's it. I like. I, hey, all I need is a chance, right? So <laughs> now, that's uh, right. Let's get back to talking about some of the interior aspects that are unique to the early Type Three variant. Yeah, yeah. The um, the interior is another easy way to spot um, differences in earliest cars, and the, the easiest thing to see is the upholstery. There's something called a salt and pepper interior mm -hmm. and so it's a combination of vinyl and cloth and the cloth is a unique um pattern of black and white that's why they call it salt and pepper that uh is built into the interior and goes about halfway up the seats and that's different than carmen guillas were and it's different than the 1964 models were when they went with uh, full vinyl interior now is this is the salt and pepper the same salt and pepper color that's in the bus too in the later model bus no, that'd be too easy, wouldn't it? Right. No, it's a to it's a different design. Uh, the The bus one is actually like a mesh, and it's vinyl, right? It's not cloth. Right. That's interesting. And, and so this is a cloth, and it's half cloth. It's pleated half cloth up to the center backs, and then it goes solid vinyl above that. Right. It's actually two pieces, right? So you have the vinyl um, in the upper portion of the seats mm -hmm. with that has the heat seam in it. And then you have the lower portion, which is the cloth that goes on the seating areas. So when you're sitting in it, it's super comfortable. Wow. The door panels are also half and half. And the map pocket is made out of that same cloth material. So, um, yeah, it's a super, it's super obvious when you see it. And, um, and it, it was only used in those first 61, 62, and 63 notchbacks and and uh, variants. The Type 31st had their own upholstery, not the uh, salt and pepper. The problem with the salt and pepper is, from a restoration standpoint, is that it's and it's not it's totally obsolete, right? There's none available, and so um, there's a, a company, a, a, an interior upholstery company, called SMS, and SMS um, has reproduced to that salt and pepper which is how this car and a lot of cars were able to, to have their new upholstery made to match stock. Now, is that also, is that in part in due to like people like Pedro, whoever reaching out to them, sending them samples of the fabric and then having them manufactured or how are they getting the stuff done? Yeah, that's how SMS really works is you, you find a swatch of cloth off an original upholstery. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that's been uh, wrapped underneath the bottom of a back seat or something where the sun hasn't decayed it or bleached it and then you cut that out and send it to them and it's a whole process and um sms is notorious for what projects they'll do and how long they take to do them so it was almost a, a small miracle that um, we were able to get uh reproduction salt and pepper type three early year upholstery available now when you do that do you guys have to commit to buying a solid bolt of fabric or so many yards of getting it <laughs> Um, the answer is sometimes, um, it depends if you're making full sets of, of upholstery mm -hmm. or you're just buying a couple yards of the cloth to do yourself. Right. Right. An owner can't buy more than four or five yards. That's about all you need. But if you're a vendor that's planning on making seat covers and door panel sets, that's a different story. You need more. Yeah. And then there's also, in respect to carpeting, anything different about the floor covering in it? You know, they're German square weave carpet, um, and the early Type 3s used a solid rubber or plastic, I think it's a plasticky kind of rubber floor mat. They're wrapped all the way around the interior of the uh, feet area, both in the front and the back. And that's one molded rubber piece instead of separate rubber floor mats that were typical in beetles where you could take them out and dust them off and throw them back in this is one molded piece and this as you can imagine the rubber is incredibly delicate and breaks if you look at it so finding a complete molded early rubber front mat and rear mat is almost impossible and how i mean so they don't no one's reproducing that as of yet no, nah, of course not. You know, there's only there's only a few cars out there and almost nobody goes original restoration anymore. People are putting in carpet throughout the whole thing and making it easier on themselves. Yeah, I mean is the even even the texturing of the fabric is a little bit different 
or the of the plastic um yeah it's it's molded in a um gosh almost like a basket weave shape you know where um and you can see in some of those close-up pictures uh just how the material looks and it has definitely a texture to it yeah it looks almost like uh you know and sometimes i don't know if it would be would it be you know it wouldn't be carmen building those that would be the actual vw plant so did they ever use on any other cars that you can sometimes cross it over from yeah we haven't found anything that we can cross over to this uh to make it match with you know we just haven't found anything that works now in respect to the seats uh what else do we have interior wise that's unique to the early models um, inside the early models used a rotary heater knob, which is a round knob, just like the beetle and the type 14 Carmen Ghia used. And that controlled, you, you turned the knob to get heat applied and come on and you turned it off to, to push the cable and stop the heat from coming on in the later years in 64, they came out with a dual control that was on the tunnel near the e-brake. So the 61 to 63 cars have that rotary knob and it has a little red dot on top of that red on that ivory knob. So that's pretty unique for the inside. Um, the, uh, the e-brake boot is an anthracite color rubber, really hard to find a, an e-brake boot. You can see the gray shift knob and uh, sorry, gear shift, uh, e-brake handle and that gray boot um those are color, mat the, color uh, match to the gray yeah yeah anthracite it's called yeah and uh in the in the dash they have push button controls also called piano keys depends where you're from uh that control the lights and the wipers and the rheostat for the gauges and those are those signify all the early years up through 64 so that's a really nice way to spot an early car as well in the speedo you'll see uh, a, um, a red needle gauge for the Speedo, and then it has a 140 kilometer or a 90 mile per hour dial. And uh, those were early in the early years because, of course, you had the single carbureted car, and it wasn't going more than 90. Once you got to 64 in the S model series, you were going 100 and uh, they changed the speedometer to 100 instead of 90. Yeah, it's You can see the dash pad as well. The dash pad is an early style that wraps around the front of the car, very American-like. So the dash pad itself actually merges with the door pads to give it a round look, and it's called a wraparound dash. And those wraparound dashes cracked like crazy, Finding one is incredibly hard to do, and none are being reproduced that I know of. Um, typical prices for those uh, for the early years are fifteen hundred to twenty five hundred bucks just for the pad. Yeah, and, so pretty and, ridiculous. And the the wraparound dash stopped in sixty six or sixty four. Uh, I think the wraparound dot dash stopped in sixty six. Okay, and then also yeah, I think so. window cranks. So the, the dished window cranks are the ivory dished ones. Mm -hmm. Those were used through 65 as well. They're plastic, so they break pretty easily. There are some solid ones that came out in 1966 uh, that a lot of people prefer to use because they're more sturdy. But uh, these dished ones are the, the ones that are correct and authentic for that early style. Now, what if you look at the glove box... If you look at the glove box, you'll see the glove box on these early Type Threes has a big button. It's a um, it's about an inch in diameter. It's non-locking, and the glove box button was uh, a, f a feature that changed size in mid '63 and went to a smaller button. So if you ever find a Type Three with a big button glove box, that's going to be an early model Type Three. This one has it, and it's 115,000 chassis number. So that's really early. That's like a November 62 car. And what, do you, so, and that's the other question I have. If you know all like the cutoff dates and production dates and stuff like this, so like roundabout, if someone gives you a chassis number, you could say, oh, that's about a November or December or January. Uh, are you based, yeah. on, based on the monthly production of these cars? 
Well, I mean, none of the monthly production is posted. Um, on the Samba, there's some general dates like end of January. Mm -hmm. um, but what we base our numbers off of is by collecting the birth certificates from the owners. Uh, Volkswagen supplies birth certificates that if you give them your chassis number, they'll give you the actual production date and delivery date and location of where that car went. And so we record those, put them in a database, and we work, we can help people identify, you know, well, which chassis number is which date. And then based on the originality of the card, then you can determine like big button, small button, details like that. Yeah, exactly right. There's a there's a big book called Progressive Refinements uh -huh. that Volkswagen put out that documented all the detail changes they made. And Progressive Refinements does document a lot of tiny details, but that's for the real uh, book. Uh, nerd that wants to spend days and days searching through every line item for just type three changes. And they actually I don't even do that. And they, <laughs> and they produced a book where you could actually see every day, the changes that were made in production. Isn't that amazing? That is why And they'll tell you things like, like a big button glove box changed to small button glove box because it was easier to open or something like that. Volkswagen always made changes that were appropriate and efficient. And um, when they did make a change, they often documented them with a serial number of the car that the first car that was applied with those serial numbers. So, oh, that's cool. Now, now, what about the yeah. interior wise? Anything unique about the seats, seat controls, or any of that kind of stuff? Um, seat controls. Well, um, uh, the seats sit on seat frames and the seat frames for the early years were also gray, anthracite gray colored. And there's a large round knob that has a special design for the early years. The one you can see there has got an angled beveled edge mm -hmm. that angles in a little bit. That's a 63 specific knob. Um, you can see the lift, the square lift knob. That's to move the seat backwards and forwards. You have to lift it up to release it from the seat rails and slide it back and forth. Those were all, those went to Chrome in later years. They went to different shapes in other years. And um, the early ones all have this gray, really easy to spot. Now, m moving to interior of the trunk, there are a few, a few unique things in the trunk interior as well, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, the, the front compartment for an early Type 3 has the washer bottle the windshield washer bottle is a different design right and it sits down and is strapped into a space just underneath the uh the brake reservoir and so this was only used in the first few years and switched over to make it easier i think but the cap and the unit was hidden up underneath the front cowl and all you saw was the filler port in 64 and then there was also there's a there's one sticker that's under on the front hood area that's a little unique in regards to the early some of the early models the yeah yeah that's tire pressure uh black sticker for tire pressure front and rear um and uh and um you can see the earth the green jack i don't know if you can see a green canvas bag the long it's about do, two feet yeah. long yeah they're, Do you recognize the length of that? That's a jack off a bus. Yeah. No. Right? And it, it's in a green canvas bag. So we discovered that uh, early variants do not have a jack uh, storage clamp in the front of the car like the notchbacks do. Mm -hmm. And the Type 34s do. So they stored this gigantic commercial-sized bus jack in this green canvas bag and had a, a tie on it. And then that same green material was used to create the toolkit for the, uh, the screwdrivers and the wrenches and all that. So they had green matching canvas bags up front for the early variants. And we just recently discovered that uh, Everett Barnes' original black 63 has the original bag that we figured out and saw, and then a few more of them popped up, and the notchbacks don't have them. It's only variants. And now you have, you and yours in particular, you have a uh, a toolkit for yours. And, I'm, and I, I, being a VW guy and bug guy, I'm normally used to seeing the hubcap style toolkits. Right. Yeah, those are the metal ones, right? That mm -hmm. clip inside the uh, the rims of the uh, the spare tire rim. For a Type Three, it's a little bit different because um, you had more 
tools available to you. This is a Hazit kit. It's called a Hazit Tourist 2. And this was a plastic kit with a larger dynam diameter than the uh, beetle kits that you've seen. A lot more tools in them, too. And um, they had all the Hazit tools that you could need to service your Type 3. These kits were sold by the dealership. They weren't included with a new car. And they have different stampings on the front of them. So on the top, there's a stamping that'll say Hazit Tourist 2 or VW 1500 for some of the early ones. And um, so those are pretty collectible these, these days. I've seen a couple for sale that are in the uh, 2000 to 3000 price range for the toolkit. Holy cow. I mean, I was going to say, because yeah, up until yours, yours is almost like a tuna can, like a big tuna can, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean they're um, they're fun because they do have all the tools in them, and um, and they they hinge open and closed, which is really nice. I store mine usually in the front trunk there, and it doesn't roll around or anything. It's heavy enough to sit still and and not spill over. It's got a closing clip that keeps it all secure, and um, it's just a it's a good. I, I'm personally love working with VW tools. Uh, has it tools in particular, of course. So when I need a screwdriver, I open up that case and grab those tools and, and work on them. When I need a 27 or a, a 13 or whatever it might be, I, I grab the original tools. I think that's part of the joy of restoring a Volkswagen is, is having the right tools around you and, and feeling good that you're working just as those, those mechanics did back in the sixties. Yeah, that, I think it's super cool. And, and uh, you know, it, you constantly discover new things. And I don't recall, you know, I, I know my brother, George, he was, he had a type three back when we were younger in the nineties and his was a custom type three, but he went up with that yeah. vintage look. So he did the flat lenses, the orange needle gauges. He put all this in his, yeah. in his 68 square, in his 68 square back. And <laughs> what was, what was so funny is like, we, we talk about the scarcity of these things. And as you're going through Pomona, like, Oh, look, it's cool. Some orange needle gauges, grab them. We're going to use those. You know what I mean? And it, it starts to become, right. you know, now the stuff that guys were doing a customizer stuff becomes really sought after and rare. And obviously it came out of an early car at some point. Um, yeah, I, or off of the NOS shelf at a dealer. Right, right. So I think it's... I, I think remember it's, a lot, because the cars weren't imported to the U.S., you had a lot of kilometer speedos mm -hmm. that were being swapped out for miles per hour speedos. And so those in America, at least, there was a glut of kilometer bread needle speedos that well, nobody was using. Yeah, I know that I, even from my restoration of my uh, Type 34, I still have... Um, I still have an NOS type 34 speedo. So, and I think it's, uh, oh, nice. I think it's for 65, but, uh, it just sits in my display case. Nice. If, we, if we ever have anybody that needs one, uh, you let me know. Cause I would gladly let it go to a good home to someone who needs that. Uh, that yeah, case. I got a whole garage of that stuff. So yeah. you let me know when you need yours. <laughs> So, um, now w one thing we did, we maybe overlooked on the interior wise would have been the, uh, the rear view mirror. Was that unique to an early model? So the rear view mirror is unique to a square back actually. And, um, it has a little black, um, uh, sorry, the Chrome extension extends off of the arm and goes towards the windshield. And there's a little rubber black anti-vibration piece that mounts into that thing. So it, it snugs up against the glass and prevents the mirror from vibrating. Oh. Really strange. And mine doesn't have one. All the rubbers decay and fall out. And so really, really tough to find a uh, original variant that has that that black rubber piece in there. Most of them had just to have a hole and everybody's wondering what went in there. Yeah. It's, and that's kind of the cool part of, of discovering something that was new, but it was old and a first generation versus the newer generation that had more as they started to refine the cars a little more, but it's, it's neat to find all these little unique things like, you know, with, with the, the toolbox, I've ne I've never even seen one of those toolboxes up until I've seen yours. So yeah. um, I'm not, yeah. I'm, I'm sure they're quite rare. Uh, now getting back to the car, the engine, now there's some stuff specific, uh, to the engine in the rear. What, uh, what are yep. some of the things that we're going to look at so when, engine wise? When the first type threes came out, they came out with the 1500 or 1494 CC motor and they had a single Solex 32 PHN carburetor. Mm -hmm. And so 
that was mounted just uh, north of the air cleaner sticker. You can see it there, the uh, square shaped uh, carburetor. Mm -hmm. And so this, everything in this engine bay was flattened. The air cleaner was flattened. You'll notice all of the intake that goes at the back of the motor was real tight and low. The coil is down low. Everything's at the generator and fan shroud height. Um, the normal beetle fan shroud that you're used to seeing is gone. And the cooling comes through the rear channel. There's a rubber boot that the air comes through the side vents and into the back of the motor through the crank. So you have improved cooling. And if your generator belt broke, you weren't forced to stop. All, All right. that stopped was stop charging the battery, which was a great improvement, right? In the Beetle, you break a fan belt and you're on the side of the road. Yeah. And, and now with the new side draft, you know, the new side draft and the compact design, it's really, it, you know, they changed the entire fundamentals of how the car cools. And there's questions back and forth yep. with regards to the, the, the cooling vents on the side. Now, right. eventually, eventually they changed the cooling vents down the side, correct? Uh, that's a good question. All the early cars had the, the correct, you know, early vents that, uh, go in. Are you talking about the ones that go in versus go out? Correct. Yeah. So all the early cars, the vents went in and that may have been to prevent water, right? That I would assume to prevent water from coming into that space and getting into the car. I don't know if it aided it or not, but, um, you know, all the early cars have, the in events. Yeah. I just, I just thought it was interesting because as Volkswagen, you know, you look at the bus, the evolution of the bus, when they go late model, they've got huge snorkels up top behind the rear quarter windows to improve the cooling yeah. as they started to increase horsepower on these cars. Now, uh, getting back to the engine on the early ones, um, in the engine compartment, there was also something with the generator cover. Yeah, so in the earliest cars, you can see the two 10 millimeter bolts that are holding on the uh, generator cover. And this was, there's actually another one on the other side, a three bolt design. And so this made it a little bit more complicated to get that cover off. In the later years, in 64, they came out with a clamp style that had clamps on either side of that uh, cover that clamped onto the fan shroud. Mm -hmm. So this three bolt design is definitely an, a sign of an early engine. And then um, let's see here. And that's the that's the uh, uh, the other shot is the single heat riser. Is that right? A single heat riser on this motor? Yeah, it's a preheat. It's a preheat for the intake so that you would have nice warm air when you went to start a start a car on the cold day it would have preheated air from the motor coming up out of the muffler and help with making the car run under cold conditions better they did away with this after 64 and uh that preheat pipe uh was uh was gone forever and then uh with respect to the uh the this heater the heat bellow that's down low over there um that's right. A, a, you can see how rounded it is, right? Yeah. See how rounded it is? And mm -hmm. it's it's got a, a central rib in it. So this is part of the early exhaust for the early single carbureted cars that has round heat exchangers. Um, in the 60, what was it? The 65 model, they came out with a new style, which is a flat stamped steel kind of beast that uh, is a definite easy thing to spot. When you're looking at engine bay, this is, uh, these, these, uh, mufflers are super hard to find because they're maintenance, right? Cause you throw them away after 15 or 20 years when they get rusty and, um, they're just super hard to find these days. Typical prices on an early muffler like that with a preheat pipe is going to be in the four to $500 range. Wow. When you compare that to a regular, uh, bus muffler at 75 bucks, uh, that's a big difference for an early type three. Yeah. And then, with respect to closing out the closing out the kind of engine compartment, the the I've seen the reflective insulation material. Now that's factory. So that one, this one that's in this car, the factory stuff flaked off, and the insulation came out over the last sixty years. Mm -hmm. And so this is a replacement that was put on. 
this is a it, it's a dual purpose it serves as a purpose for insulation for noise as well as heat and it has four little clips that keep it in place and the edges are glued into place and it's uh, what we used for this one was um, insulation material for a hot water heater comes in a roll Oh wow! And it has a really nice diamond shaped pattern that closely resembles the original. The original had kind of an aluminum finish mm -hmm. to it, almost like a matte aluminum diamond shaped finish. And this one is as good as we can get. Most people just leave the, uh, the destroyed one in place and let the, uh, the, uh, asbestos fly around and <laughs> yeah. they don't touch it. Not, not advisable. <laughs> and now close, closing yes. the decklet is, is the, is the notch in the top of the decklet. Is that, uh, is that indicative to an early car or that's all squarebacks? So squarebacks were the, you know, variants were the only type three model that had a strap and a hook to hold the trap door, the engine trap door up. And that hook clipped into the rain gutter mm -hmm. on the back area. Once the rear window was open, once the hatch was open, this hook clipped onto the rain gutter. When, you put, when you're storing it and the trap door is closed, the hook goes into that little opening there, that little oval-shaped opening. And then the metal or the, uh, the rubber mat for the cargo area goes over the whole thing so you don't see it. So this round hole is unique to the early squarebacks. And that strap with the canvas hook is is super difficult to find as well. Now, I mean, we've pretty much covered just about all the unique aspects, which there's, I, I never knew there were so many on an early variant. Now, in particular, this car, what is the story on this particular car, the history on this car in particular? Yeah, so this is the um, 16th oldest Type 3 in the world. Um, it's chassis number is around 115,000. Um, it's pro white and it was discovered in 2017 on eBay of all places. Oh, it was found here. listed in Nebraska, North Platte, Nebraska, and the grandkids of the owner, the original owner had bought it and pulled it out of his garage. It had been locked up and nobody even knew he had it until about 2017. They opened up his garage after he passed away and found this really poor condition. It was really bad at the time. Um, square back end there and they put it on eBay for 800 bucks. Someone oh. told them that it was a 64 model and so nobody bought it. And I found it actually and looked at some of the components like the side marker lights mm -hmm. that were the high markers and I looked at the flat lights and the emblems and the big trim on the windows. I, I found and I looked at it and I go, there's no way that's a 64. And so I wrote to the owner privately through eBay and I said, tell me what the chassis number of this thing is. And they looked it up. Sure enough, 115,000 is a November 1962 production. So a 1963 model year. So I said, you know, if nobody buys it on eBay, I'd be glad to buy it. And we negotiated and I bought it <laughs> so, and they were happy. They, they got rid of it and we put it on a truck and brought it to San Diego. So you had it shipped out to San Diego. What was the overall condition of this car when you got it? I mean, how, cause it mid Midwest is, is kind it of was sort rust of, belt, right? <laughs> because it was stored for so long in the garage mm -hmm. that it was, um, it was really neat that it preserved the car from that perspective. The body, however, was a goldish color with various stages of Bondo. And obviously someone had painted it at some point and, uh, during its life when it was owned. And so, um, it had been upgraded. The, the rear reflector, were upgraded to the chrome style the front reflectors were updated to the chrome style um it had a whole bunch of weird things on it um that just didn't belong right that were taken off other cars so that's what confused most of the people on ebay that it wasn't an early car yeah that's uh, i mean that's kind of a lucky thing that you caught this car because it didn't sell on <laughs> ebay and then you end up negotiating a deal with the owner to get this car and then this i mean it's so cheap you have to buy it and say i'm just going to put this in my reserves this will be a future restoration project and then you get the car and then what happens then well i mean if it was a 64 we would have passed on it 
<laughs> just because there are so many more 64 models out there than 63 models, right? I have another 63, a, a Golf Blue one. And so we were lucky that it was a 63. Once we bought it and shipped it back, um, th we had to... Um, we had to do a whole bunch of work to it to get it to be a, a driver to running driving because it obviously hadn't been running for a long time, and um, and immediately my buddy, my good buddy, buddy Pedro Saints in San Diego here um, decided that he wanted to own it, and since he's a, a restoration artiste, uh, it, I gave it to him, sold it to him for what I paid for it, and and he got it running. He rebuilt the motor and uh made it all complete and original like a 63 model was then he uh worked on all the brakes and stripped all the brakes out of it got all the right brake components got it to be a daily driver and took it to a couple of shows even though it was ugly he took it to uh what's the big show uh in uh, southern california there with the three or four thousand cars the classic the vw classic prado prado, prado. drove it to Prado as the, you know, the 11th or 15th oldest uh, variant in the world. So it was pretty cool that he got it as a driver no, and, that, um, and then he put it on the shelf to do a restoration of another car. And so this car has been in between so the then, two of you, this car has been in your possession since what year? Uh, 2017 was when we got it off eBay. So, so he has it, gets it run and puts it back on the road and then who, what, what finally triggers him to make the decision to start the full restoration? So he put it on the shelf once it was a daily driver. Um, he, he had originally imagined it to be a shop truck, right? To carry mm -hmm. parts around and move engines back and forth and transmissions and all that. Only Pedro would do that, right? Right. Um, and so, <laughs> so um, he, he just let it sit there and worked on his... Uh, type 34 restoration. He's working on a pair of type 34 restorations and it took him 18 months to do those lickety split, typical Pedro style. And then he decided to jump back in on the, on the variant. So in 2021, when the uh, dreaded COVID was happening, he decided to use his time jumping into the restoration of the body and the interior and everything else for this car. And I mean, it's, it, it's a phenomenal car. I mean, when obviously people that, that are listening to this were probably looking at the magazine at the same time, but I, I find it so much more educating to actually get the history because sometimes we just flip the pages. And if you're, if you're not a stock guy or you're not a, uh, you know, you're not a, um, you're not a restoration guy, you may just turn the page and not pay any attention to this car. But I think, you know, really looking at the uniqueness of the early the the scarcity of the early cars and the uniqueness of it it's really now me personally when i see the car i'll stop and check it out because there's so many unique parts and pieces to it that i find you know it's really it's really you know something that really grabs your attention at least for me it does now and it gives you a lot to look at when you go see some scorebacks out there now. See if you can find the push button and the big glove box and all those little tiny features that you wouldn't notice otherwise at a show, right? Absolutely. And if there's a car out in the parking lot that somebody drove to the event, you just might get lucky and find one. Yeah, that's that's the thing for me. It's like now with this the opportunity that people have just to sit and listen to this podcast and really understand all the super unique early things, hopefully – as what's happened with split windows over the past decade, there'll be a lot more early variants showing up because now people are going to pay attention and really say to themselves like, Oh, that's an early one. It must be saved. You know? So I, I sure hope so. And you know, I've, I, when I got my first 63, it was important to me to uh, find other owners to try and find the right parts, right? The early parts. And when I started meeting other owners of early cars, I, started collecting chassis numbers and building a database. And out of that, we built a, a club, a group for the world and the early variant registry came to be. And over the last, I don't know what's it been five, six years, we've collected and searched out all the early 62 and three variants and worldwide, even with all the connections and people that we know with Instagram, with Facebook, with websites, um, there's only 75, 1963s 
and 10 1962s. So a total of what, 80, 85 total over those two years. So it's ridiculously low in the number of cars that are out there. And about half of them aren't even running. Yeah, that's... I mean, so to find one that's restored is just over the top, you know, amazing. And to have one done by Pedro is... That's what, that's what I love the most about it is he is so detail-oriented that every little tiny detail was researched and asked a thousand questions about and then done right. Yeah, you you could almost call him a fanatic <laughs> when it comes to he's, the, he's a, to the power of two. Yeah, but I you know I think it's great because so many of these cars have probably been passed over and forgotten about, and they weren't paid attention to because it's just a quote unquote square back. But as the hobby right. continues to progress, everybody starts starts really getting into the weeds of the uniqueness of early models and first models and things to that extent where, you know, from, from Zwitter Beetles to early variants now. And I, I'm pretty yep. I'm pretty excited. And, and I think I, I predict one day we'll probably have a podcast on the uniqueness of the first year fastback to the second year fastback. Because I, I right. think as as it's more coming. as more people start to start to dig down into that stuff. You know, every time we take it for granted, when we buy a, a, you know, my wife drives a Toyota Highlander. Well, the first year to the second year, there's a, a numerous amount of improvements. And as we look back in history, we look at the square back because Volkswagen was so, was so committed to keeping, they put so much forethought in the original design. The overall design didn't change. It was minor refinements, you know, and I think that, you know, at first glance, you look at a square back and you think, or a variant, you just say, ah, it's just a, it's just a square back. But now as we start to break down the minutia of the earlies and, and those things, I mean, I'm really, I'm really gaining as a custom car guy, I'm gaining a huge appreciation for some of the restored cars because of these conversations. So I appreciate everything you're doing. I know you're like, you're the guy when it comes to doing the type 34 registry, the type three registry and put it like when it, when somebody's like, Oh, somebody should do that. It's usually Lee Hedges jumping up and doing that because no one else will. And he's, he, and, and you're the guy, I'm silly. well, you're, you, but <laughs> you, I think you, you're a little bit ahead of the curve in paying attention to these details that a lot of people overlook. I know I personally have overlooked a ton of them I, and I, I'm going to be, uh, uh I'll, I'll be picking up shortly a, uh, a Gia TC that I've got coming. So, oh wow! Uh, so, <laughs> I mean, you know, I run the registry for that too. By the way, <laughs> I know that's why I brought it up. <laughs> so how many? So speaking of my Gia, buddy John had one, so I started that for him. And how many Gia TCs did they produce overall total? Do you know? Is there a production number out there? Uh, oh, you're, you're, I, I, I didn't. I didn't uh, look up the cliff notes for that one, but that's all right. I think it's like one hundred seventeen thousand or. 20 i can't even remember yeah can't even remember well we'll follow up oh with god a, there's like there's like a hundred left well we'll follow up with a podcast on that when i get mine so uh it, it's definitely Sounds great. great i'll but, let you take over the registry <laughs> i'll be the the lone guy on the registry <laughs> no there's we got a, we got a lot of them we have a, a huge presentation from the rest of the world and and there's probably a hundred of them out there so yeah everybody's super excited about that one as well so Lee, if people want a great to, looking car, it, it is, you know, to me, it looks like a baby Maverick, you know, Ford Maverick, Yeah, you know, but a lot look, of people say it looks like the mating of a, of a Carmen Ghia and a nine eleven. Yeah, it, it does. It's got a lot of unique features, but, uh, yeah. anybody wants to get in touch with you, uh, how do the, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Uh, Google's best. You can type in my name and that usually pops up. You can go to Facebook and type in my name and that pops up. And as far um, as the you can type 34 anybody, world, you know, my, my email is Lee hedges at T 34 world.org. And you can send me emails. You can message me. You can, I'm pretty much on all the platforms. So you can ask around and somebody will find me. And what you like the most is to get the VIN numbers just so we can keep, we can you know, try that's to track just the only the way. It's the only way to prove it's a unique car yeah. and to follow it photos. There's no way to do that. And taking your word that it's a 62 just doesn't work. <laughs> Everybody thinks that they have what they have until we prove otherwise. And, um, and you know, part of the reason is, is that once you know exactly what it is, then you know what the right parts for it are. And we can help you find the right parts for it. 
Yeah. And that's what, that's the whole reasoning behind it is Volkswagen has so many changes. We've shown them here, but so many changes over just a, a one year period. And it's all based on what the chassis number of the car is. So, well, man, I listen, we Lee, really I, love helping people. Yeah, no, I, I commend you a hundred percent for everything that you're doing for the hobby, man. And, uh, before we wrap up anything that, that you wanted to, uh, any special thanks or people that are kind of on your team that help you through this massive hunt of everything? I know we got Pedro out there. Man, you know, um, my amigos, we have a couple of amigos here in San Diego that we stick together. And Pedro, Saints, Jack Fisher, Jason Weigel, myself, and, and Eric Hand, who's up in Northern Cal, we are really uh, work hard to help each other get the parts we need, buy the parts we need, borrow each other's stock when somebody doesn't have the part they need. And those four guys really step up every single time somebody's working on a car. Wow. Um, and, and they research and they, they just go the, the full distance to help everybody out. So I couldn't have done anything without them. Oh, that's fantastic, man. Well, listen, I appreciate everything you do, Lee. And I think it's, uh, it's definitely it's a lot of work and i know that you i know that you do it because you love the hobby that much and and i and it's the same reason i do the oh, podcast sure. you know what i mean nobody's paying no one's paying me to do this <laughs> but i do it because that's right it's important work that 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 i believe is is it's entertaining it's educational it's it's everything on so many levels and I enjoy it, and I and that's why I really dig talking to you about this stuff because I know you're you're obsessed about it. And thanks for everything you do, man. Well, it goes both ways, you know. I, we've known each other for quite a while, and um, you picked a niche that really has been monumental in getting people to know who the real players were in the VW industry and to see the faces and hear their words and preserve their passions into into history so that's a it's a really unique something you've done and and i'm proud of you it's hey, awesome i appreciate it buddy well um i look forward to seeing you at the next event wherever i'm gonna be wherever you'll be hopefully uh i don't know i, I may somehow try to figure out how to get down there to uh to san diego for something i do have that wheel for you i've already i've already taken care of that <laughs> and that has been secured so that is going to be a gift from me to you because I, I you know i told my friend i said well let, let me know what it costs and he says no i explained who you were he says no nah, man a guy like that deserves to have this wheel because of what he's doing you know just give him the wheel so yeah it's uh well you're gonna need a couple of parts for your type 34 <laughs> anyway and one day Mikasa is Sukasa. that's it well i've i've got i've got i, I just got to start turning wrenches it's up on the rack and i got to start bolting the pan up and, and start making some progress but uh i plan to get there yep. sometime soon well cool lee well, i'm here to help thanks so much for everything man of course buddy all right thanks for having me on you got it if you like that podcast and i know you did make sure you share this podcast with all your friends if you want to support the podcast go to let's talk dubs.com Click on the merch tab, pick up some merch, some sticker packs or whatever you want to help support the podcast. I appreciate you guys. Don't forget, go subscribe to the YouTube channel. There'll be a link in the description below in the podcast. So appreciate all you guys for listening. Until next week, later. You probably don't know that there's a new Volkswagen out that doesn't look like a Volkswagen. Volkswagen.